Hello, I'm Michael Morpurgo. And I'm Michael Foreman. And this is our lovely book, Flying Scotsman and the Best Birthday Ever. Written by me and illustrated by him. Flying Scotsman and the Best Birthday Ever by Michael Morpingo, that's me, and Michael Foreman, that's him, because he did the pictures. Here we go. My dad was a train driver, but he wasn't just any old train driver. His train was the great Flying Scotsman. My favourite birthday treat when I was little was to walk with Mum and Dad to King's Cross Station in London to see Dad off to work. We'd stand on platform 10 and watch him patting the side of Flying Scotsman, always the shiniest and most beautiful train in the station. It was all a wonder to me to see him climbing up onto the footplate of the driver's cab Pull, pulling on his driver's gloves, rubbing down his levers with his cloth, checking everything around him. I dreamed of only one thing, to be up there with him, to shovel the coal, to pull the whistle, to help him drive that magnificent giant of an engine. On each of my birthdays, Mum and I would stand there on the platform, hearing doors slamming and whistles blowing, watching the flag waving and flying Scotsman like a waking dragon groaning and grinding into life. The chuffing and chuntering would begin very slowly, the wheels hardly turning at first, but soon enough she would be moving away, wrapped in a cloud of thundering smoke and hissing steam. To watch my smiling dad waving and calling out to me, Happy birthday, Iris, was the best birthday present in the world. I felt so proud of him. My only sadness was that I was not going with him. After we'd seen the train off, I'd have breakfast with Mum in the station cafe, some lemonade and a sticky bun with a candle on it. Then I'd go off into school as happy as you like. I enjoyed going to school on my birthday because everyone sang Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you. They all sang that in assembly and the teachers and my friends were nicer to me than usual. It was on my eighth birthday that Mr Merton, our class teacher, asked all of us one at a time to make a wish. What do you wish for most in all the world? Iris, it's your turn first. You're the birthday girl. I didn't have to think about it. I want to go to King's Cross Station, get up on the driver's footplate on my dad's train, Flying Scotsman, and go all the way with him up to Scotland. It's the fastest train in the whole wide world, sir. Mr Merton smiled down at me. I know it is, Iris, but I don't think little girls would be allowed up in the driver's cab, even though the driver is your dad, far too dangerous. I lay in bed that night thinking about how unfair it was. Mr Merton didn't tell anyone else they weren't allowed their wishes. Mine was the only wish that he said could never come true. I asked Mum the next day if I could go with Dad up to Scotland on Flying Scotsman one day soon. I was sure she'd say yes, but she replied, No, Iris dear, maybe when you're older. But I wouldn't take no for an answer. I worked it all out, made a plan, and then I did it a few days later. I wrote a letter the night before. It said, Dear Mum, Gone on the train with Dad. Don't worry, I'll be all right. Love from Iris. It was a windy morning after a stormy night. I had not slept a wink. I lay there in bed, fully dressed under my blankets. I heard Dad getting up, heard the front door open and shut. I left the letter on my pillow and then I crept out of the house. It was still dark as I followed Dad to the station, keeping a safe distance behind him, just in case he looked around. He didn't. No one was checking tickets on Platform 10. 
I found an open door, climbed in, walked along and found the guard's van. Sat down beside some sacks and waited. Easy peasy. I heard the engine steaming up, felt the train trembling with it. Doors were slamming everywhere. I heard passengers' footsteps out on the platform, heard people talking, laughing. More sacks were thrown into the guard's van. The last sack landed with a thump. The door slammed closed. My hiding place was getting better and better. It was all going so well. I was sitting there, longing to hear the whistle, longing to feel the wheels turning, to hear the chuntering and the chuffing, but none of this happened. Okay, so um, welcome to the Doncaster Storytelling Festival uh, with the theme of incredible journeys this year. Um, we're really happy to have with us today uh, the fantastic Michael Morpurgo and Michael Foreman, um, the author and illustrator uh, of Flying Scotsman and the best birthday cake ever. Uh, welcome to the Doncaster Storytelling Festival, Michael and Michael. Hello, Phil, and hello, everyone in Doncaster. Lovely to be hello. with you, sort of. Hello, everybody. Fantastic. So uh, this the fantastic and beautiful book here um, commemorates the 100th anniversary of Flying Scots, uh, which was, of course, and it, uh, it confirms it at the back of the book, was built here in Doncaster. So it couldn't be a more fitting book for us to talk about today. Um, so. Uh, Michael and Michael, we have got some fantastic questions from the children of Doncaster um, and we are really hoping that you would uh, enlighten us and, and tell us a bit more about the book um, and what inspired you to create it. Um, so the first question is from Plover School um, and they're asking, why did Flying Scotsman inspire you? Were you steam train fans when you when you were younger? You going first, Michael? No, I'm going second. Oh. <laughs> um, yeah, I kind of grew up in the, in the steam age, not the stone age, but the steam age. Uh, seems a long time ago. And uh, my dad worked on the railway, but he wasn't a train driver, he was a crane driver. And he used to drive his crane and unload fish from the local um, fish market onto the trains to then be distributed all around the country. Um, um, unfortunately, he died one month before I was born, but my mother lost her husband and got lumbered with another baby. But because her, she was now a widow of somebody who worked on the railway, she had cheap rail fares. So she would take me on lots of train journeys to visit various people. And uh, so my first memory really um, is going to, uh, I was about 10 years old and I was waiting for my brother to come home from the army and I was going to meet him on the station. And in those days, he didn't have telephones. I knew which day he was coming, but what not, not, I didn't know which train he'd be on. So I was there from early in the morning, the trains coming and going. And I was just excited by the, the trains before they left, kind of huffing and puffing, and like an athlete ready for a, to, to set off on a race. <sighs> and then this would build up. And then eventually towards the end of the day, out of a cloud of smoke came my brother, tall, in his army uniform, like a hero, the kit bag over his shoulder. And that kind of instilled in me this desire to go on the trains. And as I got a bit older, I would then go with my mates on the train every Saturday to the football in Norwich. And again, there'd be this huffing and puffing, waiting, waiting, and suddenly you'd go. And it was such an exciting thing to be on a steam train. They really seemed to be alive. Yeah, absolutely. And that really comes across in the book, both in your illustrations and in Michael Morpurgo's descriptions as well. Um, Michael Morpurgo, how, how did you get inspired by Flying Scotsman? And, and did, were you a, a train fan growing up? I think it's fair to say every one of uh, the other Michael's generation and mine. Um, we, were all, we all loved steam trains. They were part of the landscape. They were everywhere. Uh, it, it seems strange now, you know, it's there are books now, like this book or Hogwarts, you know, they are Hogwarts Express. It all, it, it seems to have become something that's in a book. They were real. These, this is how you travel. So every station you went to, 
had this extraordinary smell about it and noise about it and excitement about it because as Michael has just said, they were living, breathing, they breathed steam. They breathed just more loudly than we did and there were great hoots and, and the whole movement of them was just majestic. I remember the first time I really was aware of, um, my, in my memory anyway, of a steam train was on a bridge um, in London and I was standing there with my new auntie. I was about four, I suppose. And my brother Peter would have been about six. And she had taken us for a walk to the place she knew we loved best, which was this bridge. Because on this bridge, you could stand there and the steam trains would come by and the smoke from them would simply come up over you as they thundered under the bridge and off. And it was just such a moment. But I remember this particular auntie, she was called Auntie Bess, took us there to really tell us something very important. Um, and she said, we're going on an important walk. And we're going to your favorite place and I'll tell you something very important. And what she told us was that we were going to have a new father, which was actually really quite interesting. But I wasn't interested in it at all because there was a train coming towards us. Uh, and really, I was just waiting for this wonderful moment when the smoke would be there and the steam and the, and the, the bridge would tremble. And that's what I was looking forward to. But that was the moment I was told I was going to have a stepfather. So I suppose it's, the, it's like an orchestral um, accompaniment to uh, news I didn't really want to hear. So I didn't bother to hear it and listen to the train instead. That's an amazing story. So, so dramatic for that key moment in your life. Um, yes, fantastic. So um, Our Lady of Perpetual Health Primary School are asking, have you, either of you, ever travelled on Flying Scotsman itself? No, we haven't travelled on it, but we were very fortunate to be invited to King's Cross Station when the Flying Scotsman paid a visit and we were allowed um, to actually stand on the footplate and uh, Michael I think achieved one of his lifetime ambitions by being able to pull the the, 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 the hooter Woo -hoo. a puff of smoke came up and everybody cheered the wonderful noise it was, it was a great moment I, I do wish and I'm still waiting for an invitation to to go on a journey that would be quite quite something I think and bring bring back all sorts of memories no it was amazing it looked extraordinary and, and beautiful and shiny and um Michael and I were up on the footplate and the coal was all around our feet and the, the warmth of the fire coming um or furnaces whatever they call them properly um w w was there it was an extraordinary moment and I have always wanted in my childhood a lot of boys wanted to be a a train driver and I think I must have done at one one point or another because it's the kind of thing it was said in the playground what do you want to be our army a train driver and everyone said me too me too it was a kind of um connection I think to the world about us the exciting world about us and of course you must remember that trains went places that was the really exciting thing about it. they were going somewhere and usually you weren't going but you could imagine it you know and you'd ask where's it going it's going to Brighton no, it's going to Brighton and the one's going, it's going to Edinburgh, it's going to Scotland. And you didn't even know where Scotland was. You just knew it was this big world out there. And these trains took you there. Mm. And of course, there were all those wonderful posters with the beach and Scarborough and all that. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Where the trains went. Fantastic. Um, we've got a question from uh, Soraya at Willow School. And also Hatchell Wood are asking a similar question. Uh, do you do research? before you write your books um, and if you've researched this book what was the most interesting fact you found out for Michael Foreman did you go and uh, research the train did you go and look at Flying Scotsman when you were creating your drawings I didn't go to look at the train but I had tremendous help from all the people at the Doncaster Railway Museum they sent me books and all the reference I needed. I knew that I had to get everything accurate because train uh, buffs know these things by you know, endless detail and they would spot anything I got wrong. 
And so far, nobody has kind of contacted me to say, oh, you messed up with this, it should have been such and such. Um, so the people at Doncaster were incredibly helpful. And also they checked as I was going along that I wasn't getting anything wrong. Yeah, I'd say the same thing happened only, um, I have to say Michael's always meticulous about research. He always has been. All the books I've ever done with him, and that's an awful lot now. Um, he does research and also thinks through um, possibilities and comes back to me and says, well, that couldn't have happened because of such and such. Uh, you need that. You need that, at least I do. I need the guidance of that. I like doing research, but I don't spend as much time on it as I, I should probably. And really lost in the spirit of the thing and i can make mistakes now for instance with this book at some particular point um it the, the, there's a there used to be a van where all the post went on these trains in sacks and the um, one of the things i remember is, is the, the the postman chucking sacks into the back of these uh, in, into into one of the wagons in the train and i really hadn't worked out which wagon it was where was it um and i got that wrong and all sorts of things I got wrong, and, but that's fine. That's what you do. And then there are other people around you. And in my case, Michael then has the images and he researches it really, really carefully. So he gets the images right. And then appears maybe the, the faults, the details, which, which I've got wrong. Um, and that's when um, he'll tell me, I'd rather he told me than the publisher. But if Michael doesn't tell me, the publisher tells me. Um, and, and that's, I mean, but the other day I was talking about this book. No, I was writing about it, that's right. And I called it a train. And it was on the radio, that's right. I called it a train. And someone phoned up and said, it's not a train, it's a locomotive. Yes. Well, they're probably right. But um, I just told them I couldn't spell it, so I used train instead. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Um, I've got a question now. One for Michael Morpurgo, and then one for Michael Foreman, two separate questions. Um, two schools, Hatchell Wood and Our Lady of Perpetual Health Primary School. I'm very curious about the name of your main character, Iris. Uh, and I was also wondering as well, why did you choose a girl to be the lead character? Because I think that's a key to the story, isn't it? Um, it's difficult to say why, because at some point you always opt for, you know, a girl or a boy. Uh, as being the main character in the book. And I suppose the cliche is that boys are very fond of trains. I mean, you know, Michael's told you, I've told you, you can wear boys. Um, but if you are the daughter of a, a much loved father and he drives a train and his place of work is this extraordinary uh, echoing, uh, almost sort of, it's like a museum, but of course it wasn't at the time. It was just full of people and they were going places. And this was the man that drove the train. Not only that, in my mind's eye, he was the driver of the train that um, made the record run from London to Edinburgh. And I thought, actually, have something in the story which is a little bit edgy. And the edgy thing is that she wants to drive that train. And I know, and you know, and everyone now knows that in those days girls couldn't do that sort of a job so i thought that would help the story feel real to children of today because it's an important topic now what we uh, what each of us can do and how so many of us have been stopped doing what we wanted to do for decades and decades and centuries and centuries so i thought it was rather interesting to have a girl there and you know just Oh, she just has this huge ambition. And when she says out openly in her, her class, when a teacher asks, what do you all want to be? And she says, I want to be a, a train driver. And she gets some pretty funny looks. And the response from the teacher is, well, you can't do that. And she thinks inside herself, well, you've got to be joking. I'll do what I want to do. And um, so I thought that would be more interesting than, than having a boy who was just keen already on trains. I don't know if that's right, but that's what we did. Yeah, I think it's... It surely had an impact on the, on the children who have been reading the books. I think I think you made the right decision. Really good. Um, Michael Foreman, um, Zoe from Horcross, and again, Our Lady of Perpetual Health, are asking about how you developed your own illustration style. Why do you choose watercolours to create your images with? 
Oh, it's a very, very, very good question. Um, I use watercolors because I like the way the watercolor merges one color into another. And uh, you get unexpected things. You can't totally control it. And sometimes these accidents are better than you could have imagined. Sometimes it goes horribly wrong. You have to rework it again. But I just like the, 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 the natural flow, really, of, of watercolor. And also it dries quickly. If I was working in oils, it would take days and days and days to dry. Um, but I just like the, and also I can do it in my sketchbook. I can have it on my knee out in the countryside and, and use it in that way. And that's the way I was as, as a student. I love drawing from nature, in nature. I asked Michael a question about that because it really was. I'd never heard anyone ask Michael that, uh, that before. And I've always wondered if one of the reasons um, you, um, became such an accomplished uh, watercolorist is, is where you come from. Because uh, there's, I don't know that much about painting, but I do know there's a whole bunch of painters for hundreds of years up in the east of England, around Norwich, Norwich School, I think it's called. Yes. Who, who are just the best watercolor. Did that affect you at all? Were they the earlier pictures you saw? Yes, I knew I knew of them and I you know, admired their, their work immensely. And it was particularly when I got the chance to see sometimes their sketches which was very close to what I was trying to do as, a, as an art student. I started going to art school when I was about 11 years old on a Saturday morning. And the first day, first Saturday, the teacher took us outside into an orchard, I remember. And we would sit there and draw these ancient old fruit trees. And that was the very first thing I did. And this keeps recurring again and again in my work, memories of those, of those early days. And it's the kind of thing that any child can do now, you know, just Go outside with your drawing book and, and sketch the world around you, wherever it might be, in the middle of a city or on the beach or on the mountains. Draw your I've looked also Michael's um, books over the years that skies are really, really important. And if you go to the east of England, the skies are big. I mean, they're, they're just huge and they affect everything around them, the colour. So, and he's wonderful at skies, really wonderful. At the, 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 the atmosphere in a picture very often with Michael is created by um at the sky i think but that's just my view i'm just a writer <laughs> fantastic yeah and it's a great message for the children out there to, to go out uh, and just enjoy drawing and see what you can come up with um the final questions now are both from willow school from georgia and oscar and they just like to know what you're working on next what's your next book going to be about and oscar's asking are you going to write about mallard train as well You first, Michael, or me? You. You come um, up with that. Usually you come up with the idea, so. <laughs> I, might, I might write about Mallard. I'm not shutting it out. It's just that I'm ext extremely fond at the moment of Flying Scotsman, because it's... Um, but what I'm writing at the moment is... Um, I've been writing it for some time, really. There's a wonderful story I was told by a friend of mine. Um, who has, is fascinated by um, how dogs were used in the past to drive sheep and cattle from far away places to markets in, in cities, whether it's uh, Birmingham or London or wherever, you're very often London, um, because the prices were better, I think. And so you'd have these um, drovers, they were called, um, who would take, I mean, hundreds and hundreds, sometimes thousands of these um, animals along tracks. They've been doing it for hundreds of years and all over Europe this has happened actually, all over the world it's happened, this business of driving animals a long way. And you needed to have the people to do it, they're called drovers, and the dogs to do it because you had to have dogs that were really sharp and a little scary to the cows and the sheep uh, to move them on. And I hadn't realized it, but there's a little dog called a Pembrokeshire Corgi, uh, most famous in this country because they were the late Queen's favorite dogs well they are not little sort of royal pets only they were originally working dogs in pembrokeshire in wales and they were used but on farms as cattle dogs and sheep dogs and particularly for driving these animals all the way to market and the brilliant thing is they go 200 miles 250 miles all the way and then the drovers would have to stay in london or places like london to do the deals to sell the cattle for the farmers, the sheep and the farmers. 
and that took some time and they didn't want the dogs around and they'd say to the dogs the beach dog they'd say go home that's in welsh go home and the dog could set off and go back exactly the way that she or he had come with the animals all the way back and they'd go back to the same inn where the drover had stayed and the drover had previously bathed as they came back they get a meal at the inn the dogs then they go on to the next one and the next one and they just go home on their own and i just think that's just like a swallow going home i think it's beautiful so i'm writing a story uh, really about a dog brought up on a farm in pembrokeshire and the journey this dog takes all the way up to london and what happens to him fantastic and what a different view of the corgi you give as well can't i can't wait to hear that story uh, michael how about yourself what are you working on next um i'm doing a story about a snowman who's built in a city park and is encouraged by a robin to explore the city and the snowman says i'm sorry i'm frozen stiff and the robin encourages him to move one foot in front of the other one foot in front of the other and they then explore the city together but that's a kind of journey but there's another journey i'd like to just mention if i got time it's a steam train thing um some years ago i was asked by an american magazine to do drawings of japan and i didn't want to fly there i decided i want to go by train so i went to the station in london bought a train ticket and um, went by train across um europe um, russia siberia all the way to the far south. wow it took three weeks all the way across siberia through the berlin wall it was the middle of the cold war and eventually got to the far side so that's a record of uh, and along the bottom of the drawings is just a little railway track and when we got to siberia the train was drawn by a steam train steam engine a locomotive <laughs> that's good that's wonderful Wow, fantastic. Thank you for so much for sharing that. And also, uh, I noticed at the back of Flying Scotsman book, Flying Scotsman's travelled around, yes, around yeah. the world as well, hasn't it? Um, hasn't she? Yeah. The, uh, in Australia there, and America on the previous page too. Yeah. Now, we're very lucky, you know, from a little boy brought up in the village to have travelled the world, much of it by a steam train. Amazing, amazing. So, um, just remains now, to say thank you to Michael Morpurgo and Michael Foreman. Do you have a final message for the children of Doncaster, perhaps about reading and writing or, or drawing? Um, yeah, um, I, I think it's uh, it's wonderful that you're having this festival up there. It's wonderful that your forebears built trains, famous trains, extraordinary trains, and changed the world with these trains. Um, I'd love to come up there and, and meet you sometime and see see how things are up in Doncaster. I live down in Devon, where it rains a lot, but I'm very happy here. But, and also, remember what Michael said a moment ago about going out there and just doing your drawing or your writing. You, you've got interesting tales to tell. Everyone's got a tale to tell, and your tales are as good as anyone's, whether it's Roald Dahl or J.K. Rowling or whatever it is, you've got a tale to tell. You sit down and do your Once Upon a Time and do the pictures, and just, um, enjoy it and enjoy reading preferably all my books and michael's no one else's <laughs> michael foreman do you have a final word uh, well just to, to to agree with what the other michael just said that everybody has got ideas everybody's got stories you don't have to look far just look at your family your pets your neighborhood or inside your own head and it's full of stories and because it's in your head, you're the best person to tell it. So okay. tell it. <laughs> Fantastic. So thank you once again to both Michaels, to Thames and Hudson, who published the book, and the, uh, the Railway Museum uh, as well. Um, thank you very much, and we hope you enjoy the rest. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.